Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I would, uh, my family and I would cover your prayers over the next uh, couple of weeks. I've got this week to prepare next Saturday, so in six days we will be loading into the car and heading down to Trout Run, Pennsylvania. Uh, I will be speaking at, I will be the chaplain at the uh, camp that I actually grew up going to uh, when I was eight, nine, ten years old, and I get the privilege of uh, serving there. I have, I didn't do the exact math, I have roughly 30 different speaking engagements of some kind in the seven days that I'm there, uh, between Bible studies and chapel and uh, staff devotions and everything else. So it will be a busy week but we are looking forward to serving the Lord in camp ministry this year. And then when we get back, we've got Summer Kids Club. So uh, what is it, out of the kettle and into the fire or something like that, out of the pot into the fire? So please be in prayer for us. Uh, we would appreciate that very much. Um, throughout church history, throughout world history, we, we know that the world has often looked at the church what it teaches, what it believes, what it professes and proclaims, and there have been uh, misunderstandings from the perspective of the world. They, didn't, they haven't quite gotten everything right. Uh, there's many Christians, even today, who struggle to understand what the Bible is really saying. Anybody willing to admit that they struggle to understand what the Bible says sometimes? When we have misunderstandings that can often lead to um, assumptions, or even accusations of believing something that we don't really believe or teach. The misunderstanding about the Trinity, that God is one being in three persons, brought about accusations from Jews in the first century uh, towards the church saying that you worship multiple gods. They didn't understand, they misunderstood what it meant for the Christian to believe that Jesus, the Son, that the Holy Spirit, and that the Father were all co-equally God. There were misunderstandings about the cross that led some to assume, to believe that the cross, the transaction that took place on the cross, Jesus' death, the shedding of his blood, was actually an appeasement towards Satan. That he was, he was dying as payment towards Satan. That Satan had some sort of hold on this world and he had to be bought out rather than what the biblical teaching that Jesus was the payment to God the Father. Did you know that, that Christians in the first century and for many centuries afterwards were accused of being cannibals? A big misunderstanding, I think. People heard the phrase, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and thought Christians were eating people. They took that very literally as eating chunks of flesh and blood. And we would categorize that as a massive misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper. That is not at all what we're doing here. We will not have a human sacrifice later this morning. But that's not the only misunderstanding that people have when it comes to the Lord's Supper, to the table, to communion. Perhaps you've wondered, what, what is the Lord's Supper even for? What's the point? Why do we have this little wafer and this little cup? What's the point? What do these things represent? What does it mean? Later this morning, we will be celebrating, we will be eating the Lord's Supper together. And today, we want to take some time to dive into the scriptures to understand what is the Lord's Supper about. It is good from time to time uh, to not make assumptions and to go back to the scriptures and to see what they have to say. So let's read 1 Corinthians 11. Hopefully you've got your Bibles open. 1 Corinthians 11. We're gonna begin reading in verse 17 and read down to the end of the chapter. When I get to the end, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, and I would like you to respond with, thanks be to God. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 17. This is what Holy Scripture says to us today. But in the following instructions, I, that is Paul, do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? 
What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for, the, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give you directions when I come. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's just spend a few moments in prayer before we consider the scriptures this morning. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for the privilege that it is to open up your word. We thank you that you've given it to us by the power of your spirit guiding and directing men so long ago to write these words to preserve them carefully for us over many generations so that we might have revelation from you, so that we might hear from you, from your mouth, your words, your teaching, your direction for our lives. We thank you for the great comfort that we have. We thank you and we ask for your help as we come to it, as we seek to discern and understand. Lord, we have many other things we could be pleading with you, asking you for. We have so many things in our lives that worry us, that give us cause to be anxious. Good things, right things that we need to give thought to, Lord. And yet we pray right now as we come to your word that you would calm the storms that go on in our minds, that you would calm the chaos that rages in our hearts sometimes and you would help us to be still Help us to be calm and quiet and sit at the foot of your word and to be fed by you. This is our prayer this morning, our Heavenly Father, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Taking the time to look at a passage like this uh, this morning is important for two reasons. Number one, um, for many of us who have been around church for a long time, if you've grown up in the church like I have, my dad was a pastor, my granddad was a pastor, I've been surrounded by the church, by theology, by the Bible my whole life. And it's important for those of us who are in that category to remind ourselves of some things that perhaps we take for granted. Some things that we just assume, oh yes, we know that, we believe that, but as the years go on, you forget why you believe or why that's important. It's important to come back and to remind ourselves of these things. But the other reason it's important is because the church is made up of both senior saints and new believers. And so for those of us that are new to the faith, and that could be within the past six months, that could be within the past five years, newness is relative in that sense. But for those of us who are new to the faith, new to the church, we need to be taught these things. We need to understand. You may have shown up to the church, you've heard about the good news, the gospel of Jesus, and you said, yes, I need to repent, I need to find forgiveness in him, and you've done that, and then you find out, what in the world is this business with this, these silver plates in this cup and this juice? We need to learn, we need to be taught. We need to grow in our understanding. So, what are we doing when we come to the Lord's table, when we come to the supper? Let me give you four things from our passage this morning. First, the Lord's Supper is an act of remembrance. It is an act of looking back, of reminiscing, of calling to mind the things of the past. It is an act of remembrance. Have you ever noticed how food brings back memories? 
It may be a traditional meal from your home country. It may be a family favorite. Food can take our minds back to our home or our childhoods. We say things like, man, this is just like how mom used to make it, right? We're transported mentally from the present back to the past. It can take us back to a time of happiness and joy and excitement. We have a tradition in my family. Um, Everybody in my family has the same birthday cake. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what generation you are. Everybody gets the same birthday cake, uh, chocolate banana cake. And the reason we do that is because it's the best, best birthday cake in the world, and you can't convince me of anything else. When we eat that cake, and when our children for their first birthday eat that cake, I'm transported back in my, to my childhood when I ate that cake, and all of the memories that are built up around the birthday parties that I had with family and cousins and friends. Food takes us back. Paul is writing about, as he says in verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. And then he recounts what Jesus and his disciples did. We read of that in the Gospels. Jesus and the disciples had gathered on that evening to celebrate the Passover meal. The Passover was the meal that celebrated, that reminded God's people of the past. It transported them from their present, whatever situation they were in, and it took them to their their history. It said, remember, Remember what God did in delivering our people, the nation of Israel, out of slavery, out of Egypt. The Passover meal was a a family meal, a memory meal that took them back to God's great historic redemptive act. And Jesus, as they eat that Passover meal, he takes that meal and he, he now says it's going to represent something different. It used to represent God's deliverance from physical slavery, but now this new memory meal, this Lord's Supper, what Christ institutes in the New Testament is going to represent something far greater than any physical deliverance. It's going to represent the spiritual deliverance of God's people out of slavery from sin. And we need to remember that. But there's more than just reminding us about past events. When we take the bread and take the cup, we aren't just meant to be taken back, transported back to that upper room in the first century and remember what Jesus and the disciples did. We need to remember, as we see in verses 24 and 25, something very specific. Look down in those verses. There's a phrase that's repeated that's found in both of those verses. What is it? Jesus says, do this, that is, eat and drink in remembrance of Me. It's not just remembering past events and things that happened. We're called to remember an individual. We're called to remember who we come from, where our spiritual family origin is found. Eating this meal, the Lord's Supper, ties us, it connects us to our family past, to our family history. Chocolate banana cake doesn't just remind me of of my history, my past. There's something greater and special that takes place when I eat that. I know that sounds really weird and spiritual about cake, but bear with me for a moment. Because that cake came from somewhere. As far as I know, and I could be wrong, it came from my great-grandmother Nancy. And so every time I eat that cake, I'm not just transported back in my childhood, I'm connected to my family past, and I'm reminded that this is where I come from. This is who I am. This is where my blood is found. Jesus tells his disciples to remember him. The Lord's Supper reminds us of Christ, of his person, and his work, what he accomplished. A lamb was sacrificed at the Passover meal. Jesus is the better and more significant sacrifice. His sacrifice is all that is needed, which is why we don't repeat it. We simply remember it at the table. The table reminds us of why his sacrifice was necessary. It reminds us of who we are apart from salvation in Jesus. We who were once dead in our trespasses, we who were once slaves to sin, condemned to death because we were enemies, rebels of God, we who were once headed for hell, we who were once far off have now been brought near. And we remember what we were, And we remember what he did, his sacrifice. 
the Lord's Supper is an act of remembrance of who Christ is and what he did. Secondly, the Lord's Supper is an act of the gathered church. It is an act, something that we do together as the church. It's not something that we do alone. It's not something that we do with this me and Jesus kind of attitude out under a tree. We don't remove ourselves to participate in the Lord's Supper. We don't we shouldn't do it at weddings or as I saw somebody last week or the week before, somebody went to the state capitol building in the United States and they, uh, what I would say, pretended to have the Lord's Supper there as, as like in a way to try to evangelize or try to call down God's blessing on the nation of the United States. The Lord's Supper is an act of the gathered church, not something we do on our own as a way to get God to do us what, do what we want him to do. It's a family meal that must be done together. Three times, if you look down in verse 17, verse 33, and verse 34, we see the phrase that Paul uses again and again, when you come together. He says, when you come together as the church, in verse 18. He also says, when you come together in the same place, in verse 20. Do you understand what Paul is driving at here? The family meal is meant to take place together with each other. We are not meant to come get the meal and then scatter into the living room and some scatter into the backyard. We've lost that family tradition of gathering around the dining room table. Our culture has just kind of lost that tradition. But we need to retain that mentality when it comes to the Lord's Supper. We celebrate it as a family, excuse me, as a family meal together as the intentionally gathered people of God. The church is the assembly. We looked at this a few weeks ago, months ago. I've lost track of what day it is. Uh, We looked at what the church is. The church is the assembly, the gathering of God's people, the gathering of the redeemed, of those who are committed to Christ, committed to his way, and committed to his people. Remember that Paul is writing to the Corinthian church He's writing to a particular definable people. He's writing to those who have committed themselves to one another, which we would say is expressed in the form of church membership. Let me explain, just take a few moments to explain why we as a church, as Richmond Hill Baptist Church, place a high value on church membership. We have not always done a thorough job or maybe even the best job at explaining what church membership is or why it's important, so let me try to explain. Church membership is a covenant between believers. It's an expression of commitment to one another, to care for one another, to pray for one another, to disciple and be discipled, to love one another through thick and thin. In this sense, it's, it's like the covenant of marriage which binds two people together. It does not create love. It does not make their love any more real. The covenant simply embodies the reality, the commitment to one another. And it's the same with church membership. In church membership, we look at one another and we say, I'm gonna commit to you as you're gonna commit to me. In this sense, when we don't give ourselves to membership, to church membership, to commitment in that way, it's like living together without getting married. It's like playing house. Why do people do that? Well, there's all sorts of reasons why people do that. But I think fundamentally at the bottom, you know, the foundation of why people do that, it's because they want all of the benefits of marriage without having the commitment of marriage, without being obligated to or bound to that person. I love all the benefits of doing this, but I don't want to have to be stuck with you. Entering into church membership is like giving your vows on your wedding day. And the Lord's Supper serves as that anniversary, not solely, not completely, But in part, it serves as that anniversary that, yes, remember, these people that I sit with, that I eat and drink with, this is my family, and I am committed to them, and I know they're committed to me. We're a family unit. We're bound to one another. And this is what the Corinthian church failed to understand and grasp. Paul rebukes them for, look down in verse 18, for divisions, in verse 19, for factions, for cliques, for divisions and separating themselves even within the gathered body, He reprimands them for not waiting for one another in verse 21. Some are going hungry because others are feasting. And he rebukes them in verse 22 for despising. 
shaming, humiliating one another, for being disconnected, disunified, for having no harmony. He says, you eat the meal, but you've forgotten the purpose of the meal. You eat the meal, but you eat it improperly. You eat it without the right heart of commitment to and unity with one another. There's all of this disconnection and disunity found. The Lord's Supper is an act of the gathered, unified, committed to one another church. Thirdly, the Lord's Supper is an act of reflection. It's an act that causes us to look inward, to ponder, to meditate, to contemplate the state of our own hearts. The Lord's Supper is an act of reflection. We must remember whose table we sit at, and we must remember how it is we're able to sit at this table at all. There was a song written in the early 90s. You are probably familiar with it. You probably sung it here in this church. I know most of the churches that I uh, attended sang it. It was a song called Come Just As You Are. You familiar with that song? I think it was written, the intentions behind the song were to remind people and communicate to people that you don't need to clean yourself up in order to come to Jesus. You don't have to make yourself holy and righteous before you can come to him in salvation, before you can receive forgiveness from him. That's absolutely true. We would affirm that, that Jesus died to save sinners, broken, rotten, unrighteous sinners, and we can't clean ourselves up. So come just as you are. I think there was a danger with that song, though, when we began to miscommunicate, come just as you are, and we see this in many churches today, where come just as you are, and we begin to communicate that you can come just as you are because God's lowered his standards, because there's no longer holiness and righteousness and perfection needed to stand in the presence of God. Lord, who can dwell in your tent? Who can live in your holy mountain? The one who lives blamelessly, practices righteousness, and acknowledges the truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, who does not harm his friend or discredit his neighbor. God's standards have not been lowered, have not been removed. We come just as we are to receive forgiveness, to be changed, but we don't come just as we are to remain as we are. Who can come to God's holy mountain? Who can sit at the table where the righteous one dwells. Only those who are pure and blameless. And that's why we must come to the table not on our own merits, not in our own worth. We must come claiming merits not our own, as we sang earlier, but coming on the merit of Christ and his sacrifice. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I believe that is in part what Paul means when he warns against eating and drinking in an unworthy manner, as he says in verse 27. He warns unbelievers, those who have not repented of their sins, those who have not put their trust, their hope in Jesus for salvation. Don't come to this table and eat if you're trusting in yourself. Don't come to the table if you have not come to Christ in faith. Paul is not calling for our immediate perfection. He's not saying we must be sinless in order to eat. The table is for sinners, but it's for repentant sinners. It's for those who have been saved by grace through faith. That's why Paul says there must be self-assessment. We must examine ourselves, Paul says in verse 28. We must discern, judge our hearts, he says in verses 29 and 31. We must ask ourselves, have I repented? That's one aspect of what it means to eat and drink in an unworthy manner, but but there's another. Remember, Paul is writing to the church. He's writing to those who who have repented, who have confessed faith in Christ. And remember the immediate context, that there are certain members not honoring other members, other brothers and sisters, as they ought. And this lack of honor this lack of unity with one another has begun to rear its ugly head at the table, the place that represents the unity they have in Jesus. Some are angry, so they don't wait. They go ahead and eat without others. Some are frustrated or annoyed, so they eat all of the bread and they leave nothing for others. Paul's argument, and perhaps his prevailing point with this statement, is that to eat and drink in an unworthy manner is to do so while you harbor anger and animosity towards a brother or sister. 
to eat the supper while you despise your brother who sits across the table or your sister who sits next to you, to have your relationship with fellow believers broken. The Lord takes the unity of his people very seriously. He takes their commitment to one another very, very seriously, so much so that he disciplines those who profess with their mouth but live their lives in such a way that would show disunity, disconnection for those who refuse to be reconciled with one another. Look down in verse 30. How has the Lord punished some of them, some of those, for professing unity with their mouths but living in disharmony with one another? What does he do? Paul says something very particular. He says, that is why this disunity, this profession of faith in Jesus and union with him, and yet this disunity with the people for whom he died, for those for whom he redeemed, that is why many of you are will, weak and ill, and some have died. He is not saying that every illness and every death is, is a mark of disunity. He's saying that disunity can lead to the rebuke of the Lord that comes in the form of weakness, illness, and even death. You have eaten judgment on yourself, Paul says. We cannot claim to love Christ and hate those for whom Christ died. We must pause and reflect. And the table forces us to ask, number one, am I right with God? And number two, am I right with his people? Am I right with those for whom Christ died? The Lord's Supper is an act of reflection. Fourthly, lastly, the Lord's Supper is an act of anticipation. The table is where we look forward, where expectation and excitement and hope and joy well up within us. The Lord's Supper is an act of anticipation. Have you ever gone to somebody's house for dinner and when that door opens, the first thing that greets you is not actually the host who says hi, it's that smell of dinner cooking in the oven. It's just, man, it makes your mouth water. It makes you excited and anticipate what's going to be set on the table in a few moments. The smell of food builds anticipation. It doesn't bring satisfaction in itself. Have you ever noticed that the anticipation can actually drive you crazy until you actually get the satisfaction of the meal? It just builds excitement for the real thing. The Lord's Supper is, as one commentator puts it, uh, it's, it's a lick of the spoon. Do you ever get to lick the spoon when mom made cookies? It's not the real cookie, it's just a, a taste. It's a foretaste, it's building expectation and anticipation of the meal that is to come. Jesus says in Matthew 26, Matthew's record of, of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper, he says, but I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The table builds anticipation with who we will be eating with. We'll be feasting with Christ. We'll be feasting with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But it also builds anticipation of where we will be eating. In my Father's kingdom, Jesus says, we will be welcomed to in to sit at the table of the King in his glorious and victorious kingdom. We'll be feasting at the marriage supper of the lamb, as it says in the book of Revelation. We'll be eating as the bride of the king. The bride on her wedding day gets special treatment, right? That's the picture of the way that we get to eat when we are with Jesus in his kingdom. This family meal builds anticipation of the coming kingdom and it also declares with enthusiasm, with zeal that his kingdom is indeed coming, that it's not a pipe dream, that hope is actually built on a foundation. Look down in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim what has happened in the past, his death, and declare what will happen in the future. He's coming back, he's going to return. This is why we eat the bread and drink the cup, to remind ourselves of the past, so that we might be encouraged to hold fast in the present because of the great anticipation and hope that is coming in the future. At the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, John records the words of Jesus, surely I am coming soon. 
Do you know what John's response is to that? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's what the table is. That is us voicing in with John, amen, come, Lord Jesus, come. It's a cry of response, of longing, of desire for the return of the king. The Lord's Supper is just that taste, just that foretaste that builds anticipation and makes us cry out, come, Lord Jesus, come. In a few moments, we are going to participate, share in the Lord's Supper together. But before we do, I'd like to challenge you with four self-reflection questions, four examinations to make of your heart before we eat and drink. Ask yourself, number one, have I turned from my sin and, and trusted in Jesus for salvation? Have I received forgiveness for my sins because of his death, burial, and resurrection? Have I stopped running from God in rebellion and fallen at his feet in submission? The table is for sinners, but it is for repentant sinners. If you have not, I would implore you, do not eat. Do not drink. Do not heap judgment upon yourself for eating and drinking in an unworthy, unrepentant manner. What you need to do is take this moment, take this time to bow your head, to bow your heart, and to submit to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. For God has promised if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You must do this today because you do not know if you will have tomorrow. Today must be the day of your salvation. Cry out to God now and receive forgiveness full and free in Jesus Christ. And you Christian, you who have done that, who have received that forgiveness, do you have any unconfessed sin in your life? It's probably not a big leap to say yes. Use this as a moment to confess your sin to the Lord, to repent and receive forgiveness, not to receive salvation again, not because you've fallen out of his grace, but because that forgiveness stands fast, holds fast, holds true for you when you come to him be reminded at the table what Christ has done and confess your sin. Pour out your heart before him and receive forgiveness. Remember that Jesus has paid it all. Reflection question number two. Have I publicly identified myself with Jesus in baptism? Baptism isn't an additive, a special thing that's reserved only for the spiritually elite, those special super Christians all who have trusted in Jesus are commanded to be baptized. Baptism is an external reality of the internal reality, so an external act that reflects the internal reality. In baptism, the individual declares that they are one with Christ, that they are unified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we go all the way down and all the way up in the water. It's an external um, reflection of the internal reality. Baptism isn't a chore. It's not a drudgery. In the same way that offering those vows to your spouse on your wedding day isn't a chore or a drudgery. It's a declaration of, yes, I am unified now with this individual. And we do that with Christ. We are unified. We are one with him. Have you been baptized? Reflection question number three. Have I committed myself not just to to Jesus in baptism, but have I committed myself to, to Christ's people, to God's people through local church membership? If you are committed to the Lord, then we are called to be committed to his people. And church membership does not make us any more or less a Christian. Salvation by grace through faith, that alone makes us saved. That alone makes us a Christian. However, if we have received forgiveness through repentance and faith, if you have declared your allegiance and union to Christ in baptism, will you not also declare your union with God's people in membership, in declaring your commitment to one another? Reflection question number four. This is the last one. Am I currently walking in fellowship with Jesus' family in the local church? Do you have something against a brother or sister this morning? Are you upset? 
Is there a lack of unity? Is there discontentment between family members? Are you angry or upset that something was said or done? Paul warns us not to eat or drink in an unworthy manner. And in Paul's context, that's in the context of having disfellowship with brothers and sisters. To have this heart or spirit of disunity, of disfellowship. And Paul is not saying, don't eat in an unworthy manner, so don't eat at all. Paul isn't saying there's a big warning here, don't eat in the wrong way, and if you're worried that you might eat in the wrong way, just don't eat at all. Paul is saying there's a way that that disunity can be made unity, that that disfellowship can be brought into fellowship again. He doesn't say don't eat. He's encouraging us to seek repentance, to seek forgiveness, to seek restoration with our brothers and sisters. Don't heap judgment on yourself. Seek restoration before you share in the family meal together. One pastor shared a story Uh, at his church of two women who had gotten into a dispute with one another. And the pastor had urged the church to examine themselves before they eat and before they drank so that they might participate in a worthy manner with hearts of unity and fellowship in Jesus. And he said, I distinctly remember how one of these two women walked to the other end of the hall to the woman she had offended. They shared a long hug with tears streaming down their faces. They reconciled with one another and took the Lord's Supper as sisters in Christ, recognizing that they could forgive one another because of what this meal represented, that the Lord Jesus, through his death, had forgiven them. We can have all sorts of excuses for why we don't get along with one another. But as we come to the table, we need to be reminded and reflect in our own hearts and recognize that Christ has forgiven all of the worst sins that we could possibly commit in our own lives. And we are called to look at one another and say, yes, I can forgive you too. This is what the table is for. May we, by God's grace, eat and drink in a worthy manner today. I'm gonna ask those that are going to be helping by serving the elements this morning to come to the front And as we pass the plates this morning, let me remind you of those questions. What we are not saying is that we as a church pass the plate beyond people, that we guard the table as a church. We exhort you after hearing the warnings of the scriptures to assess your own heart. Are you saved? Are you walking in fellowship with Christ, with his people? If you are here today and you are a believer in the Lord Jesus and you are not in active disfellowship or disunity or disharmony with another church, whether it be somebody in this church or another church somewhere else, we welcome you to eat at the table, to share in this family meal with us. But reflect, take a few moments, I will pray and then we will pass the plates. Reflect on what Christ has done and do the same in your hearts towards others. Let's pray. Father, as we truly reflect and look at the darkness of our own hearts, as we reflect on the sins that we can keep hidden so easily from others, from our family, from our spouses, we are reminded that you see it all, that you know it all, and that you sent your son to die for those sins. We ask that you would would give us the boldness to expose our hearts to you. We cry out with the psalmist, create in me a clean heart, O God, Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, we pray for the encouragement of our people this morning. May we be encouraged as a family this morning to share in this family meal. We give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor for the work that Christ has done in this new memory meal. And we ask for you to do a great work in our hearts. 
And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.